Hey, how you doing everyone? It's Mike from Get Your Rock Out and I'm here in Sound Control with Savage Messiah. How are you guys doing? Pretty good, pretty good, man. Awesome. Uh, as I understand it, you've only just happened upon your support for tonight. What happened there? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. There was uh, like a couple of bands booked in, but they uh, they pulled out for whatever reason. We don't know. We found out yesterday. Had a phone call from the uh, Emma from Earache saying, uh, did you guys know that you've got no supports for tonight? It was like, uh, no. <laughs> so we put something up on our Facebook just offering the chance out for anyone to sort of come along and support us sort of thing. Sort of give some of the local guys a chance, you know. And uh, yeah, we've got got these guys. I, I forget what their names are actually, but uh, one of them's got a Savage Messiah patch on his calf, so they're all right. <laughs> this will be a pretty good story if they play here and then they go on to be the next big thing. It was like this is where it all started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never know. You know, you got. Start I'm just guessing. And uh, you guys played with Soulfly here a couple of weeks ago, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's been a really, really great tour. We've been on the road with them for like ten days. And uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely really, really nice guys and all the venues that we've been in, they were like really, really good. And yeah, yeah, absolutely, amazing experience. And, and yeah, I mean, great, just <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, i tell you what, this is probably the start of our Hammerfest coverage because you guys are going to be there. Um, you're looking forward to it. It's very freshy lined up. You know, you got to really bring it if a creator and overkill on top of the bill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, really looking forward to it. Actually, I mean, it'd be nice to have a couple of days off for the back of these headline dates and stuff. But I'm, I'm itching to get a Hammerfest, man. It's going to be killer. We always have a really good, really good time there, anyway. And um, we're doing an acoustic set on the Friday as well. So we've got an extra nice accommodation. So it's just going to be beer o'clock I think when we get a hammer face so. <laughs> interesting thrash acoustic how does that work well you might, we might surprise you we might surprise you I'm, I'm not going to give it too much away but we've got a couple of things in store for that so yeah it should be fun it'd be different it'd be different I've bust out the wet 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 covers again or something I think. I'll look forward to that um, <laughs> let's talk about your new album The Fateful Dark first of all uh, how is the relationship with Ear Rake you recorded your last album with them how's it going uh, yeah yeah I mean um, we after uh, Plague of Conscious I mean we the, the, the thing with uh, Faithful Dark is that we, we started like all together in the rehearsal room um, thinking about it and uh, as like four guys all together uh, Plague of Conscious was more uh, all the ideas they were from um, uh, Dave Silver the frontman so yeah the, the new one has a bit on, has a bit more influences from everybody so uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Eric is seems like Eric is really, really pleased with that, and everybody of us is. So yeah, we're just looking forward for the album coming up, the fourth of April, right? Yeah, uh, seventh, seventh of April. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, uh, it was supposed to be out the tenth of March, but they decided for the UK chart to pull it, to push it um, uh, until the seventh of April. So yeah. We've got just one month now. <laughs> I'm going to embarrass one of my colleagues because he reviewed the album, and uh, he he said he said um, that you really stepped it up from the previous album, you know, uh, playing a conscience. Uh, what was different this time around? Was there anything that you guys stepped up? I mean, no, having a new drummer obviously has got to uh, improve things. Well, I mean, generally speaking, I mean. Um we knew we had to make a better album than Plague of Conscience. Really pl proud of that album, but um, we just really wanted to really go for it, hammer and song sort of thing. So we put ourselves under a lot of pressure, what, rather than sort of record company pressure or anything like that, to just try and do our best sort of thing. And um, like Andrea said, like just concentrated in the rehearsal room, sort of getting ideas together as a band and thrashing through some ideas as a group sort of thing so you can really sort of start to think mm, that doesn't work this does and start sort of weeding out all the sort of weaker riffs and all that kind of stuff but at the same time like the band kind of went through a period of like rediscovery we started sort of listening to all the sort of old new wave of british heavy metal stuff all the old thrash stuff that we we're into and stuff and um sort of really really sort of gather our influences and all that kind of stuff and it sort of made us all realize why we all love Maiden and we all love Metallica and stuff and just try and capture a little bit of that vibe because if you capture a tenth of what those sort of bands can create and the reason their fans are so fanatical about what they do we thought we've got to try and get some of that and I think we've captured it quite well and the reviews have 
sort of spoke for themselves really that we're really really strong it's an album we're really really proud of the label are proud of it and uh, hopefully everyone else will be as well so yeah it's interesting the three covers that you had um, as bonus tracks you know a maiden cover a motet cover and a lightning to the nations from diamond head which is interesting because that's i think the only track off the album that metallica haven't covered in some form or another yeah, yeah. um <laughs> what are your thoughts on diamond head their place in the history of metal i mean maiden and motorhead you know really massive very influential diamond head very influential but not as big mm. kind of uh, kind of a strange conundrum there yeah i mean um the that cover uh dave really really wanted to to do it he's a he's a massive fan of course of, yeah. of the band so uh, yeah the first two songs the Iron Maiden one and the Motor one of course they are really famous and we were, we were all up for them but then Dave said oh yeah we have to do it as well like into the nation absolutely so we said we've been there just listening to it and said yeah that's that's the right song to do absolutely so um, yeah I mean in the end it, it turned up as a really great song to cover so <laughs> we are really really pleased with that as well but we really wanted to do a motorhead cover as well but like dave said in metal hammer, hammer the, like last last month like the world doesn't need another ace of spades cover yeah. so we wanted to go for something a little bit less obvious and we thought well they've in the last few years they've made some really really good albums that are sort of kind of overlooked and almost overshadowed by the back catalog so we was having to listen listen through some like some songs I was like, oh, what, what about Killers? I was like, we are the Killers. He's like, yeah, got us after that. So we went to rehearsal, like jammed it out and stuff, and it sounded really good. So I thought, sod it, let's do that, you know. And of course, all three bands very influential on thrash as a genre. Um, what are you, what are your thoughts on when people say Lightning to the Nations and also uh, Black Metal by Venom both came out in 1980? But a lot of people say they may be the first thrash metal albums. Who do you go along with that? Yeah, I mean. Um, Especially something like Venom, I mean, it, it had that sort of motorhead sort of speed, but it had that extra something, you know, like even motorhead, as unhinged as it is, it still, it stays on the tracks. Venom, it could, it, it could derail at any minute, but it doesn't. It just goes, it's just... You, you want to say motorhead might more musicianship than Venom? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll get back to um, Fateful Dark Air. I want to embarrass my colleague again. James Ingle said... Uh, Cross of Babylon, the um, single that phrase said, it has all the makings of the band's big single from this album. It has that stadium filling vibe, uh, choruses electrifying, and powered by the thunderbolts of Zeus. Oh, cool. <laughs> is he is he right there? I think so. I mean, um, when we play it live, it definitely definitely has that effect, like the the middle section and stuff with the solos. People are just sort of like, "Wow, that's so fucking cool," you know. And uh, even when we started writing the song, like in rehearsals and stuff, it just had a a vibe about it it was just like yeah man this is this is really cool but it what we try and do i mean we're like big thrash fans as everybody knows but we're so into all the sort of old british just heavy metal stuff we've really tried to marry the two on this album and i think cross of babylon is a really good example of that with um like the thrashy kind of metallica-esque sort of verses and then uh almost goes a little bit Judas Priest in the sort of pre-chorus and then you got the sort of Iron Maiden style sort of middle eight and stuff like that so I think that one sort of sort of gets the point across quite well really yeah strong song on the album he also said that there was um, an element maybe of progressive metal a little bit would you go along with that uh yeah, I mean, yeah, I would say so, absolutely. As well, uh, in in Crush of Babylon, there's few few beats that you can you can catch, that you can hear. That, that there's few progressive as well. Um, I would say there's few progressive metal as well in uh, uh, like Zero Hour as well. So yeah, as I said before, it's like uh, this album is kind of um, comes with all our influences, and I'm a Personally, I'm a big fan of drink theater, um, so you know it's uh, it's kind of you cannot really say that it's a progressive album, of course. But you can you can feel a little bit of everything. You can feel heavy metal, of course, trash, um, progressive as well. Uh, you can feel blast beats as well in a few songs. So there's a there's a really bit of you know every kind of music. So yeah, yeah, you could I could agree with that. I could agree with the progressive men and progressive music on it. I always find it interesting with thrash bands because um, I remember speaking to Snake from Voivod and he was um, very adamant that 
first album to second album to third album was a progression from punk thrash to thrash to progressive. Mm. Do you think thrash metal is the kind of music that you know you can just about do anything with? You can take it in any direction. Yeah, I mean, it's it's music. You can do whatever you want with music. It's the most expressive form of art. You know, you can be soft, you can be hard, you can be complicated, you can be simple. Anything you want with thrash. With the speed element of it, when you start adding in the sort of progressive influences and all that lot, to execute a lot of that kind of stuff with speed, you have to be quite proficient at what you do. So I suppose if you're sort of getting a bit bit tired writing albums, sort of just going like machine gun riffs, and you start trying to mix it up a little bit, it does keep you on your toes as a player. So yeah, I, I suppose some, some thrash bands have got a little bit more progressive as they've sort of gone on through like a, a, a few albums like testament like for one some of their early stuff's quite progressive you know lots of time signature changes like you come in with a stomping four four and then it'll just sort of go to a sort of six eight sort of swing for a couple of bars and then back in sort of thing so yeah yeah I, I'd, I'd agree with what he said there yeah uh, looking ahead to the future, I mean, I know the album's just come out, you're just touring it and everything. Do you think that there's still room for, like, this uh, this Savage Messiah sound to progress, or do you think maybe you might have nailed it on the album? Um, we don't really know. As you said, I mean, the album is just um, came out, so uh, we, we are... Um, actually, we were thinking about just start already now to thinking about the new album in rehearsal. I didn't do that, did I? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, uh, we are still waiting again for the response of the of the people. Okay, so if we uh, if we are gonna see that few tracks with few progressive things on it, they're gonna be like really, uh, mm, I'll say, uh, they might be like really good for for the other people. We can, yeah, absolutely. We just go straight and you know thinking about other progressive things to do other progressive songs to make uh, yeah yeah I would say it yeah absolutely I mean that's that's the kind of music that we yeah. we've chosen so I, mean, I think I think we really found our stride like with the songwriting like on this album I, I'd, I'd say it's our strongest album by by country mile and um, as proud as we are of it and as strong as the album I, I think it is I know we've got better albums in us for sure like the more and more we keep writing like Andrea said we'd, we've already started coming up with some ideas for the next record and uh, even already the ideas that we've come up with it's just like yeah man if only we wrote that six months ago sort of thing that could have been on the album sort of thing but even better sort of thing so yeah there's better albums in us yet I think um, The Faithful Dark is the, the start of things to come I think for Savage Messiah and uh, with all the um, the elements of the classic bands and your influences, how important is it to still maintain that unique sound, the sound that makes Savage Messiah, you know, your own band? You've got to stick to your guns. If you take a band like Metallica or Maiden, like one of the real big classic bands, they didn't compromise for anyone. You know, Pantera as well. I mean, yeah, they were a hair metal band in the first place, but when they found their sound, they were like, that's it. That's what we're doing. If anyone, if you don't like it, fine like if you do great you know they'll just sort of like take it or leave it this is what we do and we will always do it and having that continuity in your music and with your fans you can't you can't falter with it really because just do what you do and do it well instead of trying to please everybody please the people that really give a shit you know that's what i say anyway <laughs> All right, well, uh, seeing as the show is pretty much going to start any minute, I think we'll have to wrap this up. Do you have a message into the camera for all our readers that get your rock out? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hope you all enjoy The Faithful Dark when, uh, when it comes out in April. Uh, thanks for the, the ongoing support. All the savages all over the place. Been great. It's been uh, absolutely killer seeing them all meeting everybody on tour with Soulfly and, and, and these headline dates. So, cheers. This one's for you. Um, he has just stolen my words, so I absolutely agree with him. <laughs> Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Um, hope to see you soon, wherever, on the road or any other gigs. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Savage Messiah, I'll see you guys at Hammerfest. Have a good show tonight. Yeah, cool. We'll cool. Thanks, man. Thank you very much.